I am Elle Penelope, author of Epic Fantasy and Paranormal Romance, and welcome to My Imaginary Friends, a look behind the scenes of an author mapping the worlds in my head and making them a reality. Hello, friends. Today is Saturday, December 7th, 2019, and this is episode 44 of My Imaginary Friends. I'm Leslie. So this week's best thing is the trailer to my brother's new television show that's coming out on Netflix dropped this week. The show is called Soundtrack. It starts December 18th, 2019, just a few days away. I'm linking to the trailer in the show notes. And so this is the first time that my brother, Paul James, is his name, if you want to look him up on on IMDb, he's been working steadily since he graduated from college. He went to Syracuse, did it, was a drama major, and... um, Right after that, he got his first film. Um, So he's been working steadily in the industry for a long time. So it's been like 16 years, I think. Um, And, you know, there's it's it's ups and downs. The (laughs) Hollywood is crazy. I can't imagine how he has been able to survive. But this is the first time that he's at the top of the call sheet, which um, is a big deal. And so it is an ensemble cast. And it's about a lot of different characters, but he's in every episode and I'm super proud of him and I'm so excited to see the show. I visited the set when I was in Chicago in April because they shot primarily in Chicago. And um, so from what I know, and I haven't seen any of the shows now, my mom has had a preview of some of the episodes, but I'm going to wait and, and watch it with everybody else. The pitch, there was an article that came out and the creator of the show said the pitch was something like, what if Paul Thomas Anderson made This Is Us? So it was sort of like, I think, Magnolia and This Is Us, based on the movie, loosely based on the movie Pennies from Heaven, which I haven't seen. It's a musical, sort of, in the fact that they break into song, but they're lip syncing. So it's called soundtrack, because if you watch the trailer, he talks about, you know, everyone's life has a soundtrack. And so there's times in our lives where there are songs that sort of exemplify what we're going through. And so in the show, the characters break into song, they lip sync, they have big dance numbers, they're kind of like dream, dream-ish dream sequences, and then they get back to the drama of their daily lives. And it's about love, all different kinds of love. Um, and so, yeah, I am super excited about watching it. <laughs> so yeah, Netflix, December 18th, it's called Soundtrack, starring Paul James. And there's other big stars in it, like Jenna Dewan, Marianne Jean-Baptiste plays my brother's mother, which I think is fantastic, and I wish I could have met her. Christina Milian is in it, um, Campbell Scott, Madeline Stowe. So it's got some really, really good actors in it. And um, yeah, so if you have Netflix, I would highly encourage you to check it out. I'll probably be talking about it more once I see some of it. In other news... I did finish the sequel to Six of Crows, which is Crooked Kingdom by Lee Bardugo. And, you know, those books, they're so fantastic. Like, they're just really, really good. And they're really inspiring. Just from a from a filling the well perspective, um, I kind of feel like I want to look at them again because they've reinvigorated my desire to write a heist story, which I talked about. And, you know, I've had this idea for a long time. Not even an idea, just a desire to write a heist story. But I, I'm not sure if I can, you know, it's one of those things where those are really complicated stories, and they're very clever, you know, and I'm not sure that that is my talent. But I do want to give it a try, because it is like, the idea has a lot of energy behind it right now. So what happens when I get a new story idea is I grab a new notebook, I use um, these moleskin journals. So this is um, like a full size, the largest size. Although usually I got the largest size by accident. I was using this, like the journal size, which is something like seven by nine. And this one is like eight by 11, whatever. Um, They're like just craft paper, brown, plain. And then I usually decorate them with stickers as I go through the process of writing the story. So um, I have a brand new one. It says heist at the top of it on the front. So I know I can, you know, um, differentiate it from all the other notebooks. And I've just started making notes. I get a new story idea. I create a new notebook for that story. And I just dump any idea that comes to me. So I really, it's still just very early stages of this idea. And I don't know when I'll get to write it. And I don't know if I will actually write it. Um, Everything that has gotten a notebook has not become a book, although there are 
they're all in various pro- like various stages of the writing process. And I do hope to finish everything I've started at some point. But as time goes on and like new ideas come, it seems less and less likely that I'll be able to finish all of the old ones. Regardless. So I don't even have characters or a plot right now. You know, it's I I, I think I was telling someone that it's sort of like like looking at a group of people very far away that are in shadow and blurry, you know, and as they come closer to me, they'll they will get into focus more. So what I've started doing is just listing potential character archetypes, you know, um, and my goal for the next over the next few months probably is going to be to research the genre conventions and um, expectations of a heist story. So that means watching a lot of heist movies, reading some more heist novels, and um, just trying to figure out what are the things that have to be in them. So there's a book, Screenwriting Tricks for Authors by Alexandra Sokoloff. She actually came to DC, I think last year or the year before, and did a masterclass with the Washington Romance Writers, which I went to, and then I got her book, or maybe I had gotten her book before. But um, a lot of a lot of people who teach writing, you know, talk about it in different ways. These the idea of genre conventions, and sort of, um, you know, Sean Coyne in the Story Grid talks about obligatory scenes, and there's just things that have to happen, like a romance. They have to meet. They have to fall in love. There's, there's, um, you have to have a happily ever after. There are certain things that happen in every romance, and if they don't happen, then it's not a romance, and people will be not only disappointed, but they'll be mad. One of the tips in uh, the screenwriting for authors book is that you watch movies in the genre, and she actually has you chart out and basically break down the stories into their acts and their sequences. And so you can see um, all of the different elements that uh, that make up these stories. And so the back, you know, big chunk of like the back fourth of her book is going through a bunch of different movies in different genres and breaking them down to show you how to do it. There are other resources from like StoryGrid on StoryGrid genres, and I haven't even broached that yet in terms of what what a heist be in in that methodology. Um, so. I don't know that I'm going to necessarily sit down with a notebook and um, and break down these movies. I might. It's probably a good exercise. I've done it before with um, uh, another genre for a book that <laughs> I haven't written yet. Well, that is not done yet. That is one of the many that are in progress. <sighs> so I'm compiling a list of heist movies, and my husband is very excited about this <laughs> homework of mine. Um, and just, yeah, over time, in the background, I'm going to start trying to construct the story, thinking about the characters. Um, so not only doing the genre stuff, but it's going to be a 1920s heist in one of my two worlds. I think that it's going to be our world, because I think I really want to bring in some like real-life Harlem Renaissance type stuff to it, as opposed to it being in the Earth Singer world. So I've pretty much decided it's going to be in the Angelborn world, which is our world. Um, but I can still, it's our world, but with people with powers, basically, which which seems to serve the story that is slowly forming in my head. So I have to do some period research. I'm not a big, well, I am and I am not. Like I'm, I do a lot of research for my fantasy novels, but because they're set in a second world, you know, fantasy world, the research is, um, it's cursory, I guess. Like, I don't have to dig too deep. I find out, okay, when did they invent fire extinguishers? When did, you know, they start using oxygen for burn victims or fire victims, um, like smoke inhalation victims in the medical field? And if that was in the vicinity of the 1920s, then I figure I can use it in my world, which is just an alternate world that is very similar. But it's also kind of diesel punk, so I don't have to, you know, stick too closely to anything. Whereas if I said it in our world, basically, but with that has people with powers, that I really do. And if I want it to be an actual Harlem, which I'm not sure about, I don't know if I want to take that on or not, but I'm leaning in that direction. Well, then the research needs just like went through the roof. Um, fortunately, for another project that 
I did not get off the ground, but I started to do a lot of research and actually bought a lot of books dealing with the Harlem Renaissance and um, that time period. So I, I, I have some grounding and some that's research that I can sort of repurpose and, you know, take that stuff that I was using for this other project and, and use it for this. So there's a couple of things that are going to be happening, you know, just probably in the evenings in the background as I go through the next few months and try to make this into an actual idea. But it is really nice to have a little bit of like a fire of inspiration about something else that is not the thing that I've been working on for the past six years, you know? Um, when I first started out, I would alternate between series. So I would write an Earth Singer book, I'd write an Angelborn book, and I did that um, back and forth. And then once, you know, St. Martin's came into the picture and I've been under contract and you've got these deadlines and then, you know, the schedule's changed. So I've been trying to, like, in the gaps, work on something else because I do think that is important for me as a, as a creative to take space away from from this world and then I can come back to it fresh. And I haven't really been able to take much space away at all in the past, you know, year and a half. Um, it's been head down, earth singer. Um, and that's really difficult. And so now coming up, you know, working on the last book, working on this novella, working on, I still do have at least one more novella, uh, probably two, uh, since I, I, I might be participating in this anthology with another earth singer novella. Um, I'm not done with the world yet by any means, but it's really nice to kind of be able to split off into another project. I had been working on the third angel book, which has stalled out a long time ago uh, because I don't know if I know why, but um, it kind of brings me to something I wanted to talk about, which is like, when is it time to take a break or quit? Um, when I was speaking to that class of high schoolers a few weeks ago, someone asked me, when, when do you quit? When do you stop? And my answer had been, I don't, I don't ever acknowledge failure <laughs> like on a book. Like even the things that I say didn't go anywhere or didn't materialize or is still in progress, I haven't given up. I've acknowledged that time is finite in our current experience of reality. And uh, at this point in time, I cannot do it, but it's not to say that I won't come back to it later, but it's often necessary to actually take breaks. So one of my writer friends has been working on a book for a very long time, like years and years, and recently has been having trouble. And you know, told me the other day, she's thinking about, she's wondering if she can ever finish it. You know, she's thinking about really quitting. And my first reaction is like, no, don't quit. This is, it's going to be a fabulous book. What I've read of it is amazing and insane. And I really want it to be in the world. But I do have to respect that sometimes people need to take breaks, you know, and I take breaks. I mean, obviously there's a time for cheerleading and pushing someone through. And then there's a time to let them know that it's okay to stop if you need to stop. But I don't know the difference. And only, you know, only you know the difference. Like each individual person sort of knows for themselves. And and like, I'm not the most like emotionally intelligent person that's ever lived by far. So I'm trying to kind of figure out is it that she needs to push or that she needs permission? And my gut is telling me she just needs permission to stop for a while. I'm hoping that a, a while isn't forever. You know, sometimes we do need permission to not fail because I don't, it feels like failure in the moment. And I know that she feels like she's failing, but everybody is different. And every, and every point in your life is going to be different. And there's some times in your life when maybe you can't write, you know, maybe that is a time when you have to just be kind to yourself and take a break and, um, and do what you need to do. She's not under contract. So it's only, um, that sort of inner fire that is propelling her forward. And when that dies out, I think maybe giving it a chance to rest and hopefully one day be able to come back to it. So I think that in this in this situation that's probably the best thing 
Um, and I've been thinking a lot about, you know, trusting yourself as, as a writer, as an artist. Um, I've talked about intuition before. And um, once again, I'm kind of stuck on the story. I had a great week of writing. I'm getting to the end and, and I'm working on the second novella of Ursinger Chronicles, which I have to turn in to the editor next week. Um, and so things have been going smoothly with that. And then I had another snag. And so I'm thinking a lot about trusting myself because there's a, there's a thing in the story that I've been planning to have happen since the beginning. And at a certain point, I started second guessing myself. And I'm like, is this really what should happen? And I've tried brainstorming. I've, you know, brainstormed with other people about other things that can happen, other ways to have this conclusion. And I keep coming back to the original way. And I don't know if it's because I'm stuck on it because it feels like a fixed point in time. Like, um, like in Doctor Who, you know, he goes back and, t and forward in time, but there are certain fixed points that can't be changed. Other things can be. This plot point feels like a fixed point in time to me. And, um, but I did start second guessing myself. So now it's like, what do I trust? What do I do? Do I go with my initial impulse? Um, which has been co-signed by my, at least one of my friends. I think, no, that's fine. I don't know why you're having a problem with that. And so that can be helpful to be like, okay, well, this person thinks it's okay. Why am I second guessing it? And why why can't I get past that? Like some things you're like, hmm, maybe that's not the best idea. Let me come up with something new. And you do, and it's great. And then some things I'm trying to come up with something new, but I can't. So maybe I should trust my initial impulse. Um, and it's just that constant, like, what do I do? So that is currently what I'm going through, but that trust is necessary in a lot of different spheres. So whether it's, this particular plot point or what book to write next, or, you know, uh, can I write this subgenre that I haven't done before that is hard and is hard to pull off really well? Um, can I finish this book? Is it time to take a break? There's all of these levels where you have to trust yourself and you have to figure out what's really happening, you know? Um, I think the plot point, the reason I'm second guessing myself are external factors, are all the noise that's in our culture right now. Um, and I don't think, you know, if it was something that I thought was like offensive, then yes, please second guess yourself. But um, it's not, I don't think, I mean, people get offended by like things I don't understand anyway. So, um, but that's kind of why having a friend co-sign it is, is, is like helpful. Like, okay, it's not offensive, but it's, it's like a little edgy. It's a, it's a little, it's a cultural thing that um, is different and could be difficult, you know? And and so I think there's other voices coming in where when I first conceived of it, I'm like, okay, this is their culture and I have these reasons for it and these are the values. And um, that's why I had made this plot point. And then noise comes in. You're like, well, how will people react to it? Will they say this? Will they say that? That comes into your mind. And that is not helpful, you know, <sighs> except when it is. Like there are definitely people who put books out there where you're like, maybe they should have listened to some of this noise. And that comes at me too. You know, it's like, I had this idea that I believed for a very long time was the right way to go. And then if you have these external noises coming into your brain that's saying, oh, well, people might not like this and they might not like that. And they might be offended by this. You have to trust yourself as to whether you're doing something that, um, you know, you need to really take a second look at and consider from a different angles or whether you can stand by it and be like, no, this is the way it is. And this is why. And, um, I, st I, I stand behind this and that's trust, you know, especially today. So it's, it's a fantasy culture. It's not based on any one real culture because I, I don't like to do that. Um, and and the more I agonize over it, the more I kind of just go back to the original idea and my reasons for doing it. Uh, so that's trust. So yeah, kind of a long, <laughs> circuitous um, 
route to thinking about that. Other writing news, I received the past pages for Cry of Metal and Bone, which is Earthsinger Chronicles book three, out in May of 2020. So this is the last time I see it. I'm going to print them out and go through them uh, on paper, which helps because I've never, I mean, I do do that during the process, but um, it will have been a while since since I've, I've looked at it on paper. I did the copy edit, it's not too long ago, um, but they're moving right along. I've seen the cover, um, so hopefully that will be finalized and hopefully do some sort of cover reveal sometime soon. <laughs> and I don't know if there'll be arcs, I have to ask if there will be arcs or not. Um, but yeah, so that book is rolling along. And I also had a question from um, someone who listens to the show. I got a, a, a message um, and they were a newbie writer and um, just asking how to start. That's kind of basically the gist of it. Like she said that, you know, she journals a lot and she really wants to write, but is sort of stuck on on how to begin. And I can understand that, you know, I, I was trying to write a short story a month or two ago and it didn't go anywhere. And it, I think it didn't go anywhere because I was trying to do something very specific for a specific publication and I didn't have um, enough like mental energy to devote to that while I was doing all these other things. I was trying to slip it in and it was kind of not the kind of thing that can be just, just slipped in. When I, I think the things that can just be slipped in are the ones that come very easily are the ones where you have this, you know, energy and fire behind it. You have this inspiration behind it and it's just aching to come out. But you can't always rely on that. I think in the beginning, it can be a matter of finding something that sparks that energy and fire in you. If you don't have uh, a story idea burning to get out of you, then do free writing. That's kind of what I would do when when I get stuck and um, just nothing is coming and I have, I have the time. There's um, a book called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron, it talks about morning pages and writing like three pages by hand every morning. My hand does not allow me to do that. But um, the idea of kind of free writing every day. So I was using a website called 750words.com, which used to be free and now you have to pay for it. But there's other sites like that. And I, I wanted to do it on a website because uh, of my particular brand of crazy, like the, the, the pressure of naming a file some, and, and locate and putting it in a place on my hard drive in like a folder because my folders are organized. I know nobody understands this, but, um, I wanted a situation where I could free write without having the burden of naming a file and putting it in a folder and finding a location for it on my hard drive. And that might sound crazy to you. So that's why I was using 750words.com. If that is not an issue for you, then open up a Word document and write, just free write, not journaling, not um, necessarily, I mean, it could be, it could be anything you want. What I do you know, you watch a movie and there's one character that didn't get the ending you wanted. So write that. You read a book and you want to know more about a certain character. You want to imagine their lives afterwards. Write that. That's usually what my my kind of free writing becomes. It's it's sort of fan fiction and it becomes my own thing. And I've had stories, lots of stories come out of those things. Um, and so with 750words.com, you write 750 words a day, which is about three pages, like Julia Cameron's artist pages. So my advice on where to begin if you don't have an idea is just, um, and it is, it's sort of that pantsing, opening up your mind completely to whatever creative force is in existence and just putting a little bit, you know, each day. And sometimes I would continue the story each day and sometimes something new would come along each day. And sometimes I didn't have anything and I would just write, I don't have any ideas and it would become a journal. And then after a few paragraphs, maybe something would spark, you know, um, I would write about dreams that I have um, and making them into stories, just images, glimpses, you know, Song of Blood and Stone was inspired by like one shot in one film. Like that was sort of the catalyst of the inspiration. This one shot, this character turning around, this expression on his face as he turned around, got stuck in my head. And I created a book and a series off of that. So that's how I would start. And then one of those ideas um, can become the kernel of a story. 
So challenge yourself and, uh, you know, take that first step if you are stuck on something new to write. You don't have to wait for inspiration to lightning strike your brain. Um, it's probably best if you if you don't start that way because, uh, I don't know. I mean, any way you can start is probably fine, but when you rely on inspiration, uh, it's hard to become a professional. So you have to sort of create techniques that are like story generative. You know, I want to write a heist. I don't have a story. So I am creating some techniques to to create a story. And within that also relying on the muse because it's it's you know it's not coming necessarily from me i'm just doing things that allow me to open up myself for the story that's going to that's forming in my subconscious or maybe it's already there way 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 back and it just has to come out of the shadows out of the blurry distant shadows and into fruition and i really hope it does because i really want to write it and i really hope i can the other part is like i, I want to do this because it's a challenge and i'm not certain that i can meet it but i'm I would love to try. So that's it for me for this week. Um, getting closer to Christmas. I haven't done any shopping yet. I will talk to you next week, though, and I hope you have a wonderful week. For episode show notes and to sign up for the Footnotes newsletter, go to myimaginaryfriendsshow.com. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and check out the video episodes on YouTube. If you could leave a rating or review wherever you get your podcasts, that would be much, much, much appreciated. And My Imaginary Friends is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. For more podcasts you will love, check out frolic.media slash podcasts.